Let's say you're the first astronaut to get to Mars. You deserve a huge applause because you've just made history and officially begun a new era of development for both your home planet and the red one. At the point of your arrival, you should already know the general features of the planet you arrived on. In studying where you would have to live, you would see that its surface features look a lot like the indentations Earth has due to valleys, deserts, and ice caps. If you're worried about the day and night system of the planet, well, you have been assured that it will be just like Earth, and you don't need to worry about a major change in days and seasons. So, how would you arrive at Mars? With several companies looking into the physical exploration of Mars, you could have come through a number of routes. You could be an astronaut from NASA who's making giant strides in their work towards Martian habitation. You could also have arrived on a Starship, SpaceX's huge spaceship designed for crewed missions to Mars. You may even have come through the Chinese or Russian governments as they are showing signs of interest in joining the second space race quickly. The one certain thing is that you would have traveled when both planets are at their closest, and even then, you would have spent 260 days in space. The year is probably 2033 when you arrive there, if you're under NASA's wing. If you've got to Mars through SpaceX, it's most likely going to be a lot sooner than that. The journey to Mars does not end with the travel. Once you get there, the challenge evolves to landing on the planet's surface. Over a decade ago, scientists assessed four feasible solutions to get astronauts to the surface. One suggestion was a legged landing system, based on the lunar lander. The options to both land and take off would be an offer through that system. Alternatively, the SLS system, or Sky Crane Landing System, would use community systems to drop off rovers and other equipment onto the surface. This system would offer to unload cargo and take off abilities. The third design was an airbag landing system that would depend on the rocket for it to cut its engines and thrust above the surface of the planet, as well as an airbag the equipment would then land on. For the crewed mission, this probably would be the best route. Ten years later, some scientists have discovered other options on how to land crewed missions to Mars. Richard Davis Jr. is the Assistant Director for Science and Exploration and co-leader of the Mars Human Landing Sites study at NASA. He has said that landers will have to dive deep into the Martian atmosphere and skirt closer to the surface than we have ever done in the past, since the Martian atmosphere is the thickest near the surface. He said, the lander is so heavy that many technologies will not work, like airbags, sky cranes, and parachutes. In fact, to slow down, we will be heavily reliant on jets. This was in response to his opinion on previous landing techniques, suggested. This leads us to wonder just how heavy the crewed missions will be. For NASA, its supersonic retropropulsion technology is expected to be able to deliver the projected 20 metric ton spacecraft to the surface of Mars. For comparison, the Curiosity rover was only one metric ton. They wouldn't send you, the astronaut, there without a clear plan, so at the time of your arrival, a landing path would have already been chosen. Scientists also believe that your best option would be to land at any of Mars's poles. You need to do this because of how necessary water will be to you and because of how heavy water is. You would have to melt down the ice at the poles to get it. The next step is to set up a base. NASA's already evaluating what kind of habitation you would need to survive on the surface of Mars. NASA assigned six companies to design workable habitat prototypes in 2016, and these are the big companies. Bigelow Aerospace of Las Vegas, Boeing of Pasadena, Texas, Lockheed Martin of Denver, Orbital ATK of Dulles, Virginia, Sierra Nevada Corporations, Space Systems of Louisville, Colorado, and NanoRacks of Webster, Texas. The habitation systems would have the task of providing a safe place for you to live as you further the mission of extending our stay beyond Earth and into Mars. Jason Crewson, director of NASA's Advanced Exploration Systems, had said this, NASA is on an ambitious expansion of human spaceflight, including the journey to Mars, and we're utilizing the innovation, skill, and knowledge of both the government and the private sectors. The next human exploration capabilities needed beyond the Space Launch System, SLS, Rocket, and Orion Capsule at Deep Space, Long Duration, and In Space Propulsion. We are now adding focus and specifics on the deep space habitats where humans will live and work independently for months or years at a time, without cargo supply deliveries from Earth. There are a few things that any habitat built would need to have in common. They have to be self-sustaining, sealed against the thin atmosphere, and capable of supporting life for extended periods without support from Earth. The ISS gives you an idea of what you might live in. The International Space Station has really taught us a tremendous amount of what is needed in a deep space habitat, Rick Davis said. We'll need things like environmental control and life support systems, 
power systems, docking ports, and airlocks so the crew can perform spacewalks and repair things that break down or add new capabilities. This will mean huge, robust equipment would have to follow you on your journey to Mars. Whatever this equipment ends up being, they must be capable of taking the long journey there and still be in premium condition. Of course, this shows that you would most likely not be alone. You can't be expected to set up all the heavy machinery on your own, and thankfully, this also means that you would have people to share the burden of a new environment with and communicate with. You would all need adequate space to move around and curb claustrophobia. Davis puts it best. In the days of the Space Shuttle, missions ran for 7-15 to 15 days, and there was not a lot of space for each crew member. In a space station, the crew members are on board for much longer, typically 6 months, and we found that crew members simply need more space. A Mars mission that will last more than that would need a whole lot of space to keep the peace. The next thing that we have to think about is food. What would you eat? Astronaut food only? Well, luckily you can actually grow your own food on Mars. Eventually, since it costs so much to send things from Earth, we will want to farm on Mars. Such a farm will be really like a greenhouse, to protect the plants against the challenging Martian environment, David says. Remember that the Martian soil isn't like the soil on Earth, it requires organics the rotting biological materials the plants need. Fortunately, it contains the minerals they require, according to Davis' team. This soil is called Regoliath, and the toxic matter would need to be removed from it. NASA scientists believe that they can get the job done. One other way that you would have fertilizer on your farm would be through your human waste products. Your feces and urine would go a long way in supplying the soil with all the necessary minerals. Also remember that your urine would play a huge part in your water intake. Just like the astronauts at the International Space Station, you're going to have a filtration system that will make today's coffee become tomorrow's coffee, because of how it purifies your urine. You will probably also need medicine when on the planet. One beautiful solution for first aid will be from artificial leaves designed to work in harsh conditions. These leaves are made from silicon rubber and can take a little bit of sunlight to turn them into enough power to fuel the essential chemical reactions to make medicine and other compounds. In other words, the leaves can use sunlight during the day on Mars even though it is potentially exposed to more harmful UV rays. Another thing that you might be able to do with sunlight on Mars is convert it into electricity. NASA is working to make solar panels that you could work on Mars. NASA reports that on the International Space Station, four sets of solar arrays generate 80 to 120 kilowatts of electricity, enough power for more than 40 homes. The station doesn't need all that power, but the redundancy helps mitigate risk in case of failure. The solar power system aboard the space station is very reliable, and has been providing power safely to the station since its first crew in 2000. This shows that the space crew has some prior knowledge of the workings of a solar panel in space, and can provide a power source for you on the Red Planet. Most importantly, you need a supply of oxygen when on the Red Planet. This could either be introduced into the bulky spacesuit you wear, or you would have to work with something similar to NASA's oxygen generation system on the ISS. Mars's atmosphere is much thinner than Earth's and is composed majorly of carbon dioxide, so an oxygen source is paramount. When you've stayed on Mars for a while, probably somewhere around 9 months to a year, you get to come back home to Earth. Your return trip would need you and any other astronauts to fly a Mars Ascent vehicle and line it up perfectly with a larger spaceship orbiting Mars. If that all goes well, you could be on your return trip in less than an hour, armed with all the knowledge you need to make Mars living a more permanent reality. The first Mars astronauts have a lot to do. Do you think you're up to it? Let us know in the comments, and thank you for watching one of our videos. While you're still here, go ahead and click on one of these videos on your screen. See you there!